75 to 95 percent of a business owner's net worth is tied up in their business, but only 10 percent have a plan for monetizing that net worth, and only 20 percent actually will. This is Bob Rourke with Business Leaders Podcast, and today on the show we have Sean Hutchinson. He's the CEO and partner of SVA Value Accelerators. Sean, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bob. Sean, tell us a little bit about your business and who you serve. Our business is really about value acceleration and transition readiness for business owners around the country. We only work with private businesses. We don't focus on the publicly traded market. And we work mostly with baby boomers right now, um, with some exceptions that are sort of middle-aged folks moving into, you know, the later stage of their business career. Um, and one reason why we work with baby boomers so often is there are just so many of them, right? It's a demographic that's unprecedented in the United States. So uh, we've got probably 50% of the baby boomers that are saying they're going to transition their ownership and their business over the next five years, the other 50% say within 10. Um, you know, it's hard to match that up with market cycles and other things. So we focus on getting them ready so that they can take advantage of the window of opportunity when it's open. So, you know, the, the businesses tend to be in six different industries for us because we have specialty practices. But they're also, you know, revenue-wise, maybe 15 to 250 million. However, let me say this: this is this is really important to us. That ideal customer question had us perplexed up to about a year ago, because when people would ask, "What's your ideal customer?" we'd start answering it in the way that almost everybody else answers it. It's uh, this industry. It's you know, minimum of 15 million in revenue. Uh, the business is healthy, not distressed, so on and so forth. And one day in a strategic planning meeting, when we had a new advisor who'd come on board, he asked the same question. We started answering it the same way. And then somehow the conversation just stopped. And we all looked at one another and said, why, if the client is the owner, why are we describing our client with data about the business? Why is that the profile? It just seemed like the wrong answer. And so we created a three what we call three buckets, three classifications of owners that we think represent different points along the journey to transition readiness. So bucket number one is the explorers. Explorers are owners who are just trying to get insights and information before they decide. They're trying to get some clarity, mm -hmm. right, before they decide to spend the money, spend the time, devote the resources to actually doing value acceleration and transition readiness. The second group is the pivoters. These are the folks who have probably been sitting on their hands for a while, procrastination being you know, something that we all have to overcome. So they, they, whether it's because of a life event or something else, they, they kind of wake up and say, I gotta do something about this. And it could be because of a business event, right? Things aren't going too well in the business or something, they lose their top customer, whatever it might be, it kind of wakes them up. So they pivot from inaction to, in to action, and they start doing value acceleration and transition readiness. The third group are the triggerers. And believe it or not, we get the calls from people who just wake up one day and say, that's it, I'm done, I'm ready to transition. And we have products and services in each one of those categories along that spectrum. Our view has always been that we're not, we're, we're not trying to lasso an owner and pull them over into our world. We're trying to go to them where they are. And that's why we had to really understand the perspective of the owner about this process. And putting, you know, having those three buckets has helped us. And it also helps us when we talk to owners, we just sort of lay it out and say, where would you put yourself? And believe it or not, almost every owner that we talk to can pick one of those three things right off the bat, which tells us how to have the conversation. Now we're not wandering around in the wilderness talking about stuff that doesn't matter. You know, and, and for the folks that are listening and they go, transition, they go, well, transition? What Transition what? <laughs> well, it's transition ownership. That's right. Um, and, and that's important. That's an important part, point, and I, I'm glad you brought it up. So for a long time, the word was exit. And exit runs into a brick wall, in my opinion, pretty quickly mm -hmm. because it's got associations uh, around it that most people just don't like to talk about. Right. The, the, the D word, the death that's word. Right, that's right. <laughs> and, and, it, and, it, and it, it connotes an, an end to mm -hmm. something. 
which is which is not exactly the case, right? Mm-hmm. What we when we talk about transition, we're talking about ownership transition, but we're also talking about the transition of the of the owner into the next act of their life, mm-hmm. right? So it truly is a, a tr- it's a transition, it's a continuum, and so I really respect on I love owners. I mean, I'm I'm a third generation family business, right? So back in Oklahoma City where I grew up. So I know the stories of ownership, the things that happen along the way, the challenges that you face, the, the glories that you have, the victories that you can point to. Uh, this is one of the most important things that is ever going to happen in the life of a business owner, this kind of transition. Done well, there's all kinds of reasons to love it. And that takes planning and it takes execution. And it also takes the owner to, I think, some honesty from the owner about what they want to do next with their life. What is their life after business plan? There needs to be one, right? And it needs to be funded in one way or the other. It's Mm -hmm. like retirement. But for owners, it's a big shift in identity. I think about an entrepreneur. They've been doing it maybe for 35 or 40 years. They own a business. They've built a business. When they think about who am I going to be when I am not an owner anymore, that existential question is sometimes paralyzing and sometimes motivating. It's a hard thing to talk about. If you just place exit as a, as a sort of, right, it's a point in time, and then what? You have to think about it differently. It's a transition from one phase to the next phase. It's just a point, right? Just a point in time on the journey. You know, Sean, when, when you have um, a business owner call you, what's the typical range of initial questions that you get asked? Um, you know, interesting. There is no typical range of questions. Okay. I mean, every situation is different, which is another demonstration of that first discussion is so critical. And I think when it's initiated by an owner, they're expecting us to come to the table with kind of a packaged solution in a way, right? So when we first meet with an owner, something that often comes you know, first in the conversation is, okay, what do you guys do? And we say, it really doesn't matter what we do. What matters in this conversation is your story. It's not our story, it's your story. That's the one that we need to be talking about. So if you don't mind, that's what we'd like to talk about in the next 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever it is. Stories connect people, right? I mean, if you think about your friendships, for instance, the conversations that you have with your best friends are stories. That's how we relate to one another. That's the only way that we do it, really, emotionally, authentic- with auth- authenticity and having deep, thoughtful conversations with one another. We're charged in that first conversation with the owner to connect as humans, not advisors, to show that we're interested in the story. Uh, once we then hear it, right, once we can get deeper into it, then we can start talking about what some steps are to get them to their objectives, whatever, whatever those might be. A lot of owners in this particular area, of, of, in, in the area of transition or value acceleration, it's kind of a black box for them in the beginning. It's mysterious. Either they, they probably haven't been through this process before, they, haven't, they don't really know where to start, they don't know who to work with. So there are all kinds of sort of mechanical questions around it, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But the the through line i think in all of those is i don't know what to do i don't know what to do next and our response is let's look at the situation let's have a discussion about it and then let's decide to do one thing just to get started let's decide to do one thing there are going to be a lot more things that need to happen in the future to get you to the these objectives but we're going to start with one whatever might be the appropriate next action whatever that might be you know, in, in both of us are exit planning guys, mm-hmm. um, and you were an instructor at the Exit Planning Institute That's right. recently out in La Jolla. Mm-hmm. Um, my broad sense and impression was that business owners don't know what they don't know. I think that's true. You, my sense is they're so busy operating their company. Yeah. And they go, well, I'm going to sell it someday. Yeah. And they say, I think I know what it's worth. Mm-hmm. And you, you okay. And then they go, okay, I'm ready to sell next Tuesday. <laughs> you know, they right, now it's time to start. Time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's an enormous disconnect between 
what they've been doing and what they understand is going to take to get a, a reasonable price for their business. Yeah. And, and you know, <clears throat> and you have more to say about that than I do. I, I think you're right. Um, we don't come at it from a position of um, this is a complex process. Let us just kind of fill you in on what's going to happen next, right? Our, our position is business owners are a whole lot more smarter about their business, certainly, than we'll ever be, mm -hmm. right? Our job is to enable them through this process, to mm -hmm. facilitate the discussions that are going to be important, to help them learn how to talk about it, to understand the vocabulary, to communicate effectively internally and externally, and to be honest with themselves about what they want to have happen. It's very, very fuzzy when the conversation starts for everybody. They don't know what they don't know. We don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. Everybody's sort of trying to get to the same place, which is clarity. We always talk in our business about an owner's needs in this process. So the first one is clarity. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going for in the first stages, right? What are we dealing with? Let's do some discovery. What's the baseline here? And we can look at it from our perspective. The owner has theirs, the other people in the process who have theirs. If we synthesize all of those viewpoints, all of those perspectives and data points to, to bring together a story in a way that it has not been told before, then the owner begins to look at the situation differently because of the various professionals and people in their company, outside their company, family members, whatever it may be, we're able to then paint a full picture of what the current state might be. So that's current state. Future state is up to the owner to decide. And it's our job to create a path between the two that everybody can walk, right? It's not out of reach. It's clear. So we have clarity. The second piece that we've got to get to is liquidity, right? So that's kind of, for most owners, that's part of the objective. Now, I would say it's not always part of the objective. So if you think about a family business, for instance, and you've got you know, multiple generations either working in the business, not working in the business, they might be children, they might be you know, 1,400 cousins, whatever it, whatever it is, sometimes the transfer doesn't have anything to do with money, right? In fact, some owners will tell you they don't need to get any money out of it at all. They just want to make sure that the, it transfers smoothly to the next generation and it doesn't create onerous risk for their kids or grandkids, whatever it might be. So the peaceful, orderly transition, mm -hmm. right? Keep it in the family. The, for other owners, it's all about transferring the business to an outside party, monetizing the net worth, mm -hmm. right? Which is usually 75 to 95% for all owners. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had a few cases where I had owners with a significant amount of, significant amount of wealth outside of their business, but, um, they had underestimated the value of their business, believe it or not. It's kind of rare. So they might have $50 million in wealth outside the business with an assumption that they've got a $50 million business. So they're 50-50 and they're feeling pretty good. But then they find out their business is actually worth 150 and they haven't done any planning on it. Right Now, the risk allocation is not looking so good. Mm -hmm. But they're excited to find out that they've got more in the business that's than the right they thought. That's the right kind of surprise. Yeah, that's right? the right kind it's of a nice, yeah, It's the right kind of problem. So, but then the question is, okay, what are we going to do to grab that 150 million if that is important to you? Part of this discussion is always about what matters to you about money. Mm -hmm. That's at the core. That's one of the core questions that has to be answered. So, so I think you know it's kind of a snowflake. I know snowflake has different connotations today, but it's a snowflake effect. Mm -hmm. In it, it, every situation is so different. You'll see similarities, but every situation is so different. And if you try to bake them all down into, into their similarities, you miss the enriched stuff around the edges, which is the stuff that really counts. So one of the things that we have to do in our practice, I think, is learn how to synthesize huge amounts of quantitative and qualitative information, human, right, financial, operational, strategic, all these things have to be combined into a story, which is going to be ongoing. You make a good point. 
Well, we are asking, well, we, well, the, well, the owner is working with us and asking us to help with preparation, maybe execution of some kind of ownership transition or not. Remember, we focus on transition readiness. So we don't really care in our work whether the owner is going to exit in the next year or 20 years. Our premise is that transition ready businesses are more valuable just because they're transition ready. So our work in transition readiness is to get risk out of the business and to create value opportunities, right? The owner still has a business to run. They are still head down. We're asking them to go head up as much as they can. And in fact, there are other people in the company that we want to have, you know, head up for, to take that future state view and you can't really do this work if you can't get that, at least grab some of that attention. Mm -hmm. But we really respect the fact that we can't ask the owner to walk away and just work on this stuff over here. That would be presumptuous of us. So we want to respect the fact that the owner is doing exactly what they want to do and love, which is run a business and build a business. In most cases, they love it. In some cases, they don't. You know, I, I think about... Uh, you know, I'm a business owner, you're a business owner, yeah. you know, and I've owned a number of businesses through the year. I'm a fan of business owners. I think they have courage. I love their perspective. Absolutely. Their story is awesome. Yeah. Know, part of the reason of the podcast, record the story. Yeah. You know, and, and the difference, I think, in, in a key discriminator is the business owner that may be the one business that they've owned, run, and want to transition. Mm -hmm. And how many businesses do you think you've seen the internal workings on during your career? I don't know, probably four or five hundred. So it's a pretty big number. Yeah. So for you, you know, the perspective, you know, when's the last time you did something really great the first time you ever did it? Yeah. You know, and I think for the business owner, there's that urge to, well, I've got my my brother-in-law and I've got my other advisor too, and I think I can do this by myself. Yeah. And you touch on that a little bit. It happens a lot. And, and there is, there, you know, being an entrepreneur, there's a certain amount of self-confidence that just goes with it. And that's one of the things that drives success. And we want to make sure that, 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 that we build on that because you need a confident client. You need someone who's willing to do the work and, and not overwhelmed by it. That said, it can uh, breed risk, I think. That, that same self-confidence can be something of a liability. I have seen many, many times, I was talking to somebody today, as a matter of fact, about it. Um, successful entrepreneur, uh, had built a business from scratch that uh, ended up being sold to a strategic buyer in the same industry. Um, by all accounts, he probably made, it was never really fully disclosed, but the folks that are kind of in that community think it was probably about a $50 million sale. He did it himself. He refused to hire an advisor. He had some lawyering around him. He had some accounting around him. Um, he saved probably, what, a couple of, maybe a million, maybe two million, not having an investment banker in the deal, not really using advisors as fully as he probably could. What did he leave on the table, right? What did he, how much tax did he pay that he didn't have to pay? Uh, were the terms, was the structure of the deal built in his uh, favor or in the buyer's favor? I can tell you it was built in the buyer's favor without good advisors at the table. So whatever he left there, he left something. He certainly paid more tax than he should have. And he didn't know how to structure the deal because he'd never done it before. So entrepreneurs are self-disciplined in most cases, self-confident in most cases maybe overconfident in some <laughs> cases, but our position as advisors is always that we're never going to ask a client to do anything that doesn't produce both an immediate and a long-term return on investment. Why would we ask a client? In our, in our view, it's all about creating value. So we always tell our clients, we're never gonna ask you to do anything that doesn't add value to your business. There's lots of stuff we can fix. There's many different, there's lots of little rocks that we could pound into gravel, but they don't add value to your business. They don't increase the transferability. They don't increase the attractiveness to the outside market. They don't reduce risk. They're just stuff that we're fixing. So let's pick the stuff that matters. Let's pick the big rocks. 
and let's move those rather than spending resources solving problems that don't move the needle for you. You know, there's, there was a couple of terms in there that you've said a couple of times. One's attractiveness, readiness, and de-risking. Yeah. You want to touch on those just a little bit? Sure. So there are three ways to increase the value of a business. The one that most people fo- that most people focus on is increasing earnings, and that's a really good one to focus on, right? We want to see growth in revenue. We want to see cost controls. We want to see margin in the deal, and we want to see an an, um, uh, an encouraging pattern, which we I would I would always prefer to see something solid, something pretty stable, rather than you know spikes to high profit and then falling off you know to a to a much lower level. So volatility is one of the things, one of the value killers that we always look for. And that's that, that de-risking that we're talking about. We're really looking at the value killers in a business and going after those first. So when we work with the client, we'll say, we're gonna, let's look at the risks first and mitigate those to the extent that we can, whatever they might be. Then we're gonna focus on driving the top line, the bottom line. Because you can drive top line and bottom line all day long, but you may actually be doing it in a way that introduces risk into your business. Let me tell you why. So let's say that you've got a sales team and you send them out and they're looking for whales. You're a $50 million revenue business and they go find a whale that's worth 25 million. They, they make the sale. To get the sale, they've got a discount because they really don't have as much pricing power with a whale as you do with a diverse portfolio of customers. So you're excited, your sales team excited because they accomplished what you told them to accomplish. You're excited because your financial, at least your income statement, looks a whole lot better because you just increased your, the size of your company by 50%. But you lost margin on the deal because you had the discount and now you've got one big customer that represents a third of your revenue. So. Your top line went up, your bottom line went up, your gross profit probably got negatively impacted, which is a number that we watch like a hawk, and the value of your business went down. And in extreme circumstances, you just took a transferable business with real value in the marketplace to one that cannot transfer. In effect, you took the value from whatever it was to zero by making that $25 million sale. Now that's counterintuitive. Sobering. It's sobering, it is, because to a certain extent, nothing in that strategy from a management point of view was wrong. But from a value creation point of view, from the moment that the leadership directed the sales team to hunt whales, the risk was hiding under the bed. And everything that happened after that was perfectly logical and detrimental to value. So there's there's one story about risks that can be in a business and ways to think about them and de-risk a business. If we go in and we see customer concentration, the conversation is really about one, how did we get there? Because there's gotta be some kind of problem. You didn't just get lucky to land big mm-hmm. customers. You, there actually is a team of people or process that's making that happen. It's not accidental. So there's a risk in that process because the wrong things might be communicated. The second thing is, how are we going to address that risk? It's not just, you know, what are we gonna tell the sales team? Go, okay guys, go out and find 100 new customers now. 100 little customers. Well, there are customer service implications to that because now you got 100 customers, not 10. So are you really built to handle that? There's multiple, right? There's, there's shipping, there's packaging, whatever business you're in, the more customers you have, the more complex your business has become. So it's a whole nother set of questions. So we're first looking at risk, and that's the second category of how to drive up the value of the business, is to reduce risk. The third category is to increase marketability, right? So this is gonna be a question about attractiveness, attractiveness and marketability or trans- transferability of the value in a business. So if you think about, let's, let's just think about a piece of paper, right? That increase earnings part up at the top is gonna to be about two inches of the paper maybe. The reduced risk category is gonna be the next five inches. It's by far the biggest, and every risk has an outsized impact, either negatively or when removed positively on the value of the business. So risk impacts value much more than earnings will at the end of the day. Now that also is counterintuitive because 
in certain in the public markets, it's all about driving growth, driving earnings, right? Earnings per share. The private markets, it's not that at all. It's all about company specific risk, and that's why that category is so big. But there and there's a lot to work on, but there's also a lot of juice in working on it. It's worth working on. That third category of increasing the marketability of the business is really about learning to communicate benchmark right against your competition and be and live a best in class company whatever that might be interestingly for me if benchmarking data is readily available in most cases right you can you can get benchmarking data for 100 bucks on a whole industry when I at, when I one of the first questions that we ask when we're getting involved with an owner is how do you benchmark against your competition, right? How do you stack up? How do you think you stack up? Mm-hmm. There's a story around that that's really valuable because owners can talk about their competition and they know a lot about them, but that's pretty qualitative, mm-hmm. right? That and but it's good information. It's what we would call enriched mm-hmm. information because it's coming out of the brain of the owner. But when we ask them to scoreboard the benchmarks against their competition, they know a lot less. They probably can benchmark revenue. Mm -hmm. Everybody kind of knows where their competition stands in one way or another. They might have gotten some information from public sources, paper, whatever, whatever is available. But at the end of the day, when you start asking them questions about how how does your balance sheet benchmark against the competition? Are you best in class? Are you middle? Are you lower? How does your income statement and the factors that are on that, right? How does your operational profile benchmark against your competitors? The information gets a lot thinner. So in order to really understand marketability, you have to, you have to do one thing which will turn the light bulb on every time, and that is step outside your business as an owner and look at it through the eyes of an, an investor. The minute you do that, your perspective will change remarkably on how to create value. Most owners are pretty emotional about the way they manage their business, and I don't blame them because they got everything on the line. We talked about 75 to 95% of the net worth. They hold all the financial risk. There's a reason to be disciplined, and there's also a reason to be emotionally heavily engaged. However, when you step outside and say, look at it dispassionately, just try to strip away the emotion, just look at it, and ask yourself a simple question. Would you buy your business? Would you buy it as it is today? Some owners might say, yeah, I'm in. Some owners, more often than not, I'm sorry to say in the, in the conversations that I've had, say, no way, because it's not generating a sufficient return, financial return, to justify taking that amount of risk instead of putting my money somewhere else, mm-hmm. right? So that's another benchmark, right? In that financial return kind of profile, is the business really performing in a way that would attract an investor? And that's when it gets down to marketability and attractiveness. No matter how attractive you think your business is as an owner, the only judgment that really counts is somebody with a checkbook besides you. You know, in in thinking about that, we talked before the episode, and you have a methodology, Mm -hmm. value acceleration. That's right. Let's talk just a couple of minutes on that because, you know, for the listeners, we're going to do a deep dive series on value acceleration uh, following this particular episode. That's right. But uh, let's do a bit of a teaser, for lack of a better term, on what that's about. So we're talking about the pivoting category. Remember, explorers, pivoters, triggers. So these are the pivoters are the ones that really dive deep into value acceleration. So the Exit Planning Institute, which we talked about, created uh, a value acceleration methodology, which generally breaks down into three parts. One is discover, second is implement, right? And the third is decide. You're going to keep it or you're going to sell it. One form or another. That's many different conversations. We took that methodology, which we embrace, and we added a lot of value to it. SVA does it completely differently than anybody else that works in this marketplace, as far as I know. I haven't been able to find any other corollary. So value acceleration takes a while. Most people will tell you that it takes at least three to five years of intensive work to make significant gains. And 
value tends to increase exponentially. It's not really a linear process. So the curve is going to look like we're starting value acceleration. We're going to get a few gains early in the process, and then we're going to kind of hit an inflection point. Boy, this thing is going to turn up. And there are lots of reasons why it might take that exponential curve, but you can track pretty accurately the data, the, the data points, the factors that are beginning to add up to a company that can actually go exponential. So we started thinking about what are the things, what are the things that must be present in order to, in order to be successful, but in and of themselves do not guarantee success, mm -hmm. but they must be there. It won't happen without them, but it doesn't guarantee, it's not guaranteed if they're present. And then how many of those things would be necessary? How many of those skills, um, systems, whatever they might be, how many of those are there that can be chunked down into what we call 90-day sprints? And that's how we designed the program. That was what we call the design constraint. In our view, each one of these pieces of the value accelerator needs to have bookends on it. It needs to start and then it needs to finish. And we think that 90 days of work makes a big difference if you're working on one thing during that period. And if the team can break off enough time and break off enough attention and really stay focused on that one thing, once we complete that, we can move on to the next. Our value accelerator is built so that what we do first supports what we do second that builds into what we do third and fourth. So let me walk through those things. The first step is discovery. This is not due diligence, right? So due diligence is a list of stuff that you have to kind of check the boxes on in order to be able to successfully do a deal, right? And there's a lot of reason to do it because you can learn a lot about your company from doing due diligence. Discovery is different. Discovery is about accessing, asking the right questions, having the right conversations, and accessing what we would call enriched information about the company and all of the stakeholders in that company, whether it be the owner, their family, possibly management team, and other key employees in the company. You have to pretty much enroll a pretty big group of people to do this. It's not just going to be the owner doing the work. So discovery is really important, usually takes 60 to 90 days, and what comes out of that is a whole set of information that we can synthesize and use throughout the value acceleration process, but also gives us that all important baseline. Where did we begin? What is in fact the current state? Think current state, future state all the time. That's the whole, and the bridge between the two is the value accelerator, mm -hmm. point A to point B. Step one after discovery is decision dynamics. Now, this for me was a kind of an epiphany. We uh, are, there are two people in our company that do decision dynamics. There are three parts to decision dynamics. One figure out what matters together, two, learn to make better decisions faster, and three, manage with grace and accountability. So we believe that making better decisions faster is the basis for operational excellence. If you think about it, you can drive systems all day long, you can, you know, you can have lean manufacturing in place, I'm going to talk manufacturing for a minute, you can be industry 4.0, all of those things can be present. But if people can't make good decisions faster, none of that really can hold. So the, we felt like for all of the things that we're going to do in value acceleration after this, if people couldn't make better decisions faster and figure out what matters together and then manage that with accountability, we don't have the right framework for making your progress in the future. So step one, decision dynamics. Step two, rapid risk reduction, right? So again, going back to the idea that we need to get as much risk out of the company as we can in order to prepare the foundation for that exponential growth. Otherwise, you're just against the headwinds all the time. So there is a framework for risk reduction that we use. Um, what we're trying to do is, I guess install might be the right word, or at least embed maybe is a better word, risk-based thinking in the organization. Now, there are there are organizations that do risk-based thinking really well, but most do not. Most are opportunity-based mm -hmm. cultures, understandably. However, risk can be classified, it can be scored, and then you can decide which ones you want to take out of the company, which ones you're willing to bear. Mm -hmm. And those are decisions that are really important because you will not be able to handle every risk that you find. Then the question is, again, figuring out which ones matter, making decisions well and fast, and then managing with accountability going forward. 
let's make sure they're out of the company and not just hiding over there in the corner, ready to come back. The third one is company of the future. It's all about figuring out where we want to go and how we're going to get there. Again, it's a current state, future state exercise. There are tools that we use in that that I think are pretty unique. One is called the graphic game plan. The other one is called strategic doing. It's all about agile strategy. Again, without decision dynamics, without risk reduction, you wouldn't be able to do company of the future well. After that, productivity, right? So in private business where resources tend to be precious, where capital is not always available at a relatively low cost, here we are in the tightest talent marketplace in what, decades probably, mm -hmm. going back to maybe the 1950s. Right now, constraining growth, honestly. A lot of our construction clients, I lead the construction practice at SVA. Man, they've got great opportunity. They've got huge pipeline of work. Their backlog is very healthy. What they're doing is growing. They're getting pretty good margins on it, and they're out of people. Mm -hmm. They're just out of people. And for organizations that don't have productivity initiatives in place, which can be simply put as out of 100 steps, usually, usually in companies, 95 of those 100 steps are completely unnecessary. Even when Toyota introduced what was the, you know, Kaizen, right, the basis for lean, they took it from 95 unnecessary steps to 90 unnecessary steps and beat the world. Mm -hmm. So if you think about your company and all of the processes, if you map them out and you basically just started putting red X's through the ones that, as a matter of fact, they don't add value, right? Which is, did they change form, fit, or function? And is it something that the company, that the customer will pay for? If it doesn't fit those criteria, then it's not needed or it's just running against you. It's just cost. So by eliminating those steps, by doing value-added process mapping, we can actually identify what to take out of the company so that it can run on less, with less people, right? Just a more efficient, productive approach. And we introduced something called the feed-starve analysis, which I won't go into now because it's pretty complex, but that's the first place that it shows up in the program, and it's going to show up again in the financial accelerator. In those four, first four sprints, we have now laid the foundation for operational excellence and strategy. We know where we're going. We have a plan for how we're going to get there, and we know what our pathfinder milestones are along the way, and we become an agile organization that can implement strategy on a short cycle, 90 days at a time. There is no, well, you know, this is a three-year plan and all that. No, we, we, can, we can come up with a clear plan, but we're going to do it in 90-day cycles, and then we're going to adjust every 90 days and see where we are. I can't tell you how, the, how much that changes a business. It's really remarkable. We use it in our own business, as a matter of fact. Everything that we do in our value acceleration is something that we test in the lab of SVA and use what in concept. SVA. Yeah, what, what, I know. What concept. Yeah. yeah, practice what you yeah. preach. Then after that, sales and marketing, now we're ready to grow, right? We put in place those things that are necessary for us to begin to make that exponential inflection. Next is sales and marketing. Most companies just don't have a sales process and really don't have a sales team. And one of the big risks that sucks value out of a company is owner reliance. So owner can't go on vacation because the company would fall apart or really suffer or owner wears four. If you do an organizational chart, the owner somehow shows up in six of those boxes or um, um, they have all the major customer relationships. Um, they know things that the rest of the company probably wouldn't know if something happened to the owner. So documentation, knowledge management. So owner reliance is a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff packed into two words. And when we see it, we know that there's a whole catalog, a whole inventory of other risks that are going. If we'll, Once we take the box, the lid off that box, we're going to find a whole lot of stuff that isn't very pretty. So the when we go to sales and marketing, one of the things that we're immediately going to look for is how many relationships are vested in the owner. And nobody likes to really talk about it, but you have to take the perspective that bad things happen to good people. And so the question is, do the doors shut if the owner dies or becomes, you know, substantially disabled and can no longer work? Um, or does it keep going like nothing happened? And what you want 
obviously is the second. In most cases, what you've got is some version of the first. Pretty typical. Succession planning now steps into the picture. Most businesses haven't done much, and there's a lot of work that goes into succession planning. Marketing is a mystery in most organizations. A lot of organizations think sales and marketing is the same thing. Marketability, the attractiveness of the company, has to do in part with how it manages its conversation with the marketplace, mm -hmm. how it positions, right? what it says about itself, what kinds of values it has, and how that's reflected in the way it operates and produces either a service or a product for its customers. So it is a promise. When you are marketing, you're making a promise. The question is, can you keep it? So we improve those things. Next, financial acceleration. The cost of capital for most private businesses is just too high. And to generate a return for a shareholder, mathematically, you must generate a return that is higher than your cost of equity, right? Cost you 10% on equity, better. You're going to have to do better than 10% to generate a return. Financial, financial systems is not really our concern unless they're really bad. Some companies struggle to put a good, timely financial statement together. That can be fixed. I'm not so worried about that. What I'm worried about is financial strategy. If we have a strategy over here that we have to execute on in order to add value to the business, everybody's clear on that. If the financial strategy isn't aligned with that, if we can't get the cost of capital to a reasonable level, understand what we should be funding in the organization and what we shouldn't, that goes back to that feed-starve thing that I mm -hmm. talked about. What are we going to feed? What are we going to starve? Then capital just sort of disperses through the organization in very inefficient ways. It's hard, without good financial analysis and strategy, it's hard to tell in a company what's working and what's not. That goes to management reporting, benchmarking, scoreboarding, all those kinds of things. So now, now we're getting into more of the nitty-gritty stuff, right? The last thing we do, which may be counterintuitive, but some people think it ought to be done first, is leadership, accelerating leadership in the organization. If we had tried to do it early in the process to try to get leaders ready, we wouldn't know, one, whether we were getting the right people ready. Two, they wouldn't have been aligned around anything, right? We just would have been talking leadership in a vacuum. So nobody would have had anything to sort of hang their hat on and say, we as a team, as leaders, are going to do this and not that. The essence of leadership is knowing what not to do. So if you just got people kind of wandering around all over the place becoming better leaders, but they're not aligned around something compelling and what we would call appreciative, mm -hmm. we can go into that at some point, but if you can't attract those people to a vision and it, if somehow the vision is either uninteresting or just bad and it repels the best leaders, you have a problem. Right? You have a real problem. So what we want to do is do the leadership accelerator last based on all the other work that we've done. So you can see in some value acceleration, it's over the next 90 days, we're going to do five business things and five personal things. Um, and, we're going to, and you're definitely going to move the needle. In our value accelerator, it's really much different in terms of what we're doing with each 90-day period. Mm -hmm. And the sequencing is critical in my view. At that point, we have a company that's going to look a lot different and operate a lot differently than we did in the beginning. But we, at the end of two years, would really like to exit stage left, honestly. Because what we want to build is a company that can exist independent of us. Certainly, mm -hmm. that's part of our job. And again, we want to have been working for that period on the things that matter most to building value and creating opportunity for the owner and other people within the company. So that's the value accelerator in a nutshell. And so with that being said, this podcast could go on for days. <laughs> and so um, part of the reason we talked about value accelerator is one to give a broad brush. Yeah. All right? We're going to have additional drill down episodes that are going to deep dive into each component. Mm -hmm. All right. That'll be coming after this. Um, First order of business for the folks that are looking to reach out to you. How do they find you? Um, the, first of all, through our website is fine. You can certainly, uh, we're active on social media. Um, my email address, we can. What's your website? <laughs> our website is www.buildvalutoday.com. Okay. And you're on LinkedIn? On LinkedIn. All of our partners are on LinkedIn. We're and all active. Sean Hutchinson, S-E-A-N, Hutchinson with an N. 
That, that's not, right. That's not right. Hutchison, but that's Hutchinson. Right. Yeah, and it's uh, there's a P in there for my LinkedIn. So okay. Sean Patrick. Ah, yeah, I know a little Irish. Little, uh, just a little, <laughs> just a little. Um, and then for you, there's a couple of ways that you engage. One is where you guys have you come in as a team, mm-hmm. and then you're now developing, I think a. <clears throat> mastermind type approach yeah we have what's called the transition readiness academy so it has it we we can do half day workshops and full day workshops for companies in some cases we've done it for franchise systems or corporations with you know distributor networks or whatever it might be that's really introduction to some of the concepts that we talked about in the value accelerator we also have mastermind groups which i'm really excited about actually because i think you know a lot of people are familiar with kind of the vistage model Mm -hmm. or you know i know there are a lot of other versions of that what we thought would be useful for owners who really want to focus on this idea of transition readiness and value acceleration is to create what's essentially a 12-month program although it could be extended to 24 depends on how frequently the group wants to meet but we designed it as a 12-month program it's pure owner work right so If an owner is looking to be in a supportive, peer-driven environment with other owners, not competitors, other owners, and go through a program of 12 months that focuses on nothing but the things that we've talked about today, Mm -hmm. then this gives them the opportunity to do that. The advantage, I think, is we're not going to be able to go as deep as we can in in the value accelerator, the big value accelerator, but we can create a kind of DIY environment in a sense. And the goal of that 12 month program is for people to come out of it with a clear transition readiness roadmap. You know what I think, what strikes me about this is, can you imagine if they knew this before they started their business? Yeah. And almost everybody says, I wish there are two versions of that, right? I wish I'd started working on this from the beginning with the end in mind. And then there are those that I talk to, owners that I talk to have been through a transition and they'll say, boy, I really wish I'd known you before I did that. Because you know, it, it, and I, I think, you know, I think people get so wrapped around the axle on exit and succession. And the reality is, it's just good business. It's just good business. That's and, you right. know, and, and when you think about that, you go, why is it not taught? Why is it not known? Why is it not, you know, and so, you know, so my eyes are clearly opened up on, on the whole process and hence why we're doing the podcast. Yeah. And it's also why we're doing the deep dive. And so we've gone a fair amount of time and I typically quiz you a lot toward oh, the end, okay. but I'm going to abbreviate it just a little bit. Okay. All right. Uh, is there an influential book that you like? Yeah, let's, n- let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. Completely changed the way that I think about my relationship with business owners, both in the business development process and throughout what we do. Great book. Super. Um, add on page one of the local business journal, sharing your message. What would it say? It would probably say transition-ready businesses are more valuable. Um, it, would, it, it would, in one way or another, speak to the owner around value creation and transition readiness. For you, um, over the past few years, what belief or protocol have you established in your company that's helped you the most? Um, we move in the direction of our conversations. One of the most important things that I've learned in my entire life, it comes out of appreciative inquiry, which is the things that you talk about move you in a direction either toward what you want or away from what you want or need. So we always say we move in the direction of our conversations and we say it with our clients and we say it with ourselves. Advice to a new CEO that's assuming the role of CEO for the first time. Learn how to work with a board, one of the most important parts of your job will be governance and you gotta you gotta understand how boards work over the past few years what would or should you have said no to and why out of the hundreds of clients that we've dealt with i can think of two or three that we should have said no to which led actually led us to improve our intake process Hmm. um you know it's really important to have a connection with the client we always say connect before content and um it's really hard we we can't really help a client that can't make a good decision i guess and some people just don't want to 
act. Mm -hmm. In addition, we've just made some bad choices about who to work with. For one reason or another, I, can go, I can't go into detail, but I can think of some situations there. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many things that I should have said no to as a CEO, mostly related to I could have delegated that, but w in one way or another, I convinced myself that I could do it better and faster, which was a bad mistake. Well, Sean, this has been awesome and really looking forward to doing the Deep Dive series, which is coming up next. Me too. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bob.